Donald Trump, for some time, really since he came onto the political scene, has had an obsession, as we've covered, with crowd sizes. For him, that is the indicator of political support. Not an indicator, as it is, but the indicator. And he puts so much emphasis on that that it causes him to do something very strange, which is constantly lie and overstate the size of his crowds when his normally accurately described crowds are still big, even though, as we talk about often, Trump supporters will get in their head that him having big crowds means he can't lose elections, which that's not how voting works. Some people don't need to go to a rally to go vote. But Trump's obsession with rallies now sets up a devastating situation with him, given this newfound democratic energy, where by his own metrics, Kamala Harris just made his nightmare come true last night with a bombshell rally. That's probably not the right word. With a very significant rally in an arena, tens of thousands of people supporting the next president of the United States. And I will note, because MAGA will jump to this, Megan the Stallion, the famous musical artist, was there, and I think other people as well. So that could have contributed. Sure, 100%. But then they were sort of coping, MAGA that is, about the excitement at this event by saying they were just there for Megan Thee Stallion and they all left. But if you look at videos from the very end of the rally when Kamala Harris is speaking, it's still jam-packed. So I don't know about that, MAGA. But take a look at this. Again, I don't think your rally size necessarily means you're going to win because it doesn't. We saw that in 2020. Trump had bigger rallies, his COVID super spreaders, than Biden, who was taking... Uh, the response to COVID more seriously and Biden won fair and square but uh, this was last night in Atlanta the energy is notable and then Kamala Harris comes out on stage and look at this Pretty dang excited to see her. So this is the campaign that Donald Trump has been dreading. He has built his entire house of cards of lies on the foundation of Biden, of running against Biden. And one of the things Trump loved about that matchup is that Trump was seen as the person with the more excited base, whether you dispute that or not, with the bigger crowds and the more pumped up rallies. And again, that's not what decides elections votes do, ladies and gentlemen, but Trump hates this more than anything else because now he's going against a younger, more enthusiastic base around the person, it seems, fresher movement. That's what we're seeing. And he hates it. Now, let's talk about some moments from this rally because uh, there are other reasons Trump should be terrified. Chills running down his spine, which is stuff like this. So the momentum in this race is shifting. And there are signs that Donald Trump is feeling it. So last week, you may have seen, he pulled out of the debate in September he had previously agreed to. So, so, so here's the thing. Here's the funny thing about that. Here's the funny thing about that. So he won't debate, but he and his running mate, 
sure seem to have a lot to say about me. And by the way, don't you find some of their stuff to just be plain weird? Well, Donald, you'll reconsider to meet me on the debate stage. Because as the saying goes, if you've got something to say, say it to my face. Listen to that crowd. I don't hear a Trump crowd roar like that except for when Trump's doing anti-trans stuff. Goodness gracious. <laughs> Sad, I know. Uh, and it's true. If Trump can so boldly beat his chest, so boldly call Harris and her allies' names, so boldly mispronounce her first name, then say it to her face, Don. Don't be scared. He's willing to say that she's low IQ at a recent rally. We have Republicans saying she's a ding dong. Really high minded stuff. He said all sorts of things about her intelligence. All right. Then if you think that, the debate should be easy, right? But clearly you don't think that. And I do think Vice President Kamala Harris should make this something she brings up at every public event. Not just for the political gain of being the one who clearly is more confident in their ability to make their case in front of the American people, but instead to also, because that's important, the political stuff is important, but also she genuinely needs to figure out how to get them to debate. <laughs> she needs to chicken him into debating mock him into debating because if he does show up for that debate most likely as i'm trying not to raise the bar too much but most likely it should end well for the harris campaign and so don't just do the general mockery when someone backs out of a debate but actually figure out ways that can get under his skin that will make him go all right fine i'll debate because we want to see that happen here's another moment from the speech days we have our work cut out for us and this is not going to be easy this is hard work but we like hard work hard work is good work so Georgia today I ask you are you ready to get to work do we believe in freedom to fight for it. And when we fight, we win. God bless you. God bless the United States. So that was the ending, and I do have more for you. But another comparison I'll, I'll say as someone who has watched on this show, in preparation for this show and in person, so many hours of Trump rallies, unfortunately, the people in the crowd are far more engaged with every word that she's saying at Harris at this Harris rally than at Trump rallies. Again, they'll nearly go to sleep as he's and I'm elector, blah blah blah, you know, in electrocution and a shark. And then he'll get them back in by saying, Men and women sports, and then he goes, and then they go crazy. Or uh Joe Biden's an idiot, and then they go crazy. But for much of the rally, they're just sort of blankly staring, <laughs> as we've talked about. Not a moment like that in this speech. Even when she's going through talking about policy, people are engaged with the policy proposals she's talking about. Obviously, moments like that are very hype, and that's a difference. Here's more. So November 5th, November 5th is in... Let me just say one more time, there was a clip we've looked at before 
of Trump saying something about trans people, the crowd goes wild. And then he goes, it's so weird that y'all cheer so loudly for that, but you don't cheer at all when I'm talking about tax cuts, which is a big takeaway from this movement. They don't actually care about a lot of the policy stuff. Certain demonization-related things, certain culture war-related things, niche issue obsessions, sure, but meaningful, substantive policies, eh. So November 5th, November 5th is in 98 days. <laughs> so, in 98 days, and let's level set, friends, let's level set. We have a fight in front of us. We have a fight in front of us, and we are the underdogs in this race. We are. But you see, this is a people-powered campaign. Yeah. Ours is a people-powered campaign. In fact, after I announced my candidacy, we saw the best week of grassroots fundraising in presidential yeah. campaign history. Yeah, I actually do. It's correct as of now. I think it's going to shift quickly as we're already seeing. But I do appreciate the framing of this as an underdog campaign because that's what it is she just became the presumptive nominee and is in the average of polls still behind trump again that gap is closing but i think it's a motivator and one of the things i heard someone saying it may have been jessica tarlov on the five is that we we our movement understands is pragmatic about where we stand it's not, oh, the, the game's over. We win. No. We're thinking of ourselves as the underdogs. The reason why there's this excitement is, is not because we assume we're going to win, but because we know we can and we're excited to do the work because we believe it'll pay off, right? That's, that's the excitement. Here's more. And we are not going back because ours is a fight for the future. And it is a fight for freedom. And we are witnessing a full-on assault on hard-fought, hard-won freedoms and rights. The freedom to vote. The freedom to be safe from gun violence. The freedom to live without fear of bigotry and hate. The freedom to love who you love openly and with pride. to learn and acknowledge our true and full history. And the freedom of a woman to make decisions about her own body and not have her government tell her what to do. And then she goes on to talk about policy-wise how each of those will be protected. But for the sake of time, we will go forward. And uh, just one more clip here. And to keep our middle class strong, families need relief from the high cost of living so that they have a chance not just to get by, but to get ahead. And yes, it is true that by many indicators, our economy is the strongest in the world. But while inflation is down and wages are up, prices are still too high. You know it and I know it. And when we win this election, here's what we're going to do about it. On day one, I will take on price gouging and bring down costs. hidden fees and surprise late charges that banks and other companies use to pad their profits. And again, goes on listing policies. Love it. But this uh, segment stretching out too long. So you can watch the full thing. I encourage you to. Uh, this morning, I watched the, the whole speech and just thought it was fantastic. And she does need to make this case, which I, I love the way she said it, which is essentially the Biden-Harris administration, Bidenomics, as it was called, it was effective. It just, it was, okay? It was. The recovery from the pandemic 
all these unique problems that had to be dealt with because of that disaster that, by the way, Trump was mishandling, which made it worse. That it was going to cause disaster situations, obviously, with public health. We saw the crime spike from it and economically, as we saw in countries across the world. But when you compare how we handle it to a lot of those other countries, clearly the Biden-Harris agenda worked. But that doesn't mean that people aren't still experiencing those pains, the price increases that came of that. All of that, there's more work to be done. So saying, listen, I get it. By the metrics, we are doing pretty well. And we are far outpacing both expectations and economic expectations and our counterparts across the world. But that doesn't mean that there's not more to be done. And so here's what I'm going to do to make things even better and to minimize pain as much as possible. That's the message. Love to see it. I'll leave it there. Thank you all so much for watching this video. If you want to get extra content daily, you can do so by clicking the join button below.